we'll uh, get we'll get Cassandra to uh, you can share your story and then we'll get Cassandra to put up the uh, the slide share. Okay. First of all, hello to faces new and faces familiar. Nice to see everybody here tonight. Nice way to spend a Wednesday evening. Um, so yes, my name is Amber Pratt and I'm originally from Vancouver Island, Victoria, uh, where I studied horticulture. So I've always had my hands in the dirt doing, doing something outdoorsy. And so I studied horticulture in Victoria and I worked as horticulturalist for the largest uh, wholesale nursery on the island. And then I started taking some WSET courses, some wine education courses, because wine had always sort of been a part of our, our family celebrations and things like that. My mom's from Montreal originally. And so we'd always had to have a little bit of wine and I knew I liked it, but I didn't know much about it. And once I took that first course, my mind was blown just knowing, finding out how much there was to know about different wine regions of the world and how there were so many different kinds of wine, not just the box of red or the box of white that was in my parents' liquor cabinet. And so I just was gobbling up these courses and just fascinated by how much there was to know about wine. And once I had exhausted the supply of knowledge in Victoria because then it's it was a different place than it is now it's much more um, sophisticated in terms of food and wine now um, once I had sort of exhausted Victoria's supply I started looking further afield and I found the Okanagan College here in Penticton where they offer both a viticulture program and a uh, winery technician program. And so I moved here in 09 and took both programs concurrently. And uh, I was able to do that with the way they were scheduled. And the viticulture was extremely similar to the horticulture I'd already done. Um, so that was, that was pretty easy. Uh, but boy, was there a lot to learn about microbiology and biochemistry and stuff when it came to winemaking. And I just started throwing my resume at all of my favorite wineries that I had experienced. And I was lucky enough to get uh, my first harvest in 2009 under winemaker Michael Barche. And so I couldn't have asked for a better first winemaker to work with just um, so inquisitive and creative, as well as very generous with his knowledge and just a kind person. So we're still very good friends to this day. Um, and then from Road 13, I went on to Black Hills, where I worked as assistant winemaker and helped with the development of their uh, their diffusion line, their second label, Cellar Hand. Um, and then after working with Black Hills for a couple of fabulous vintages, um, kind of getting to experience that no expense spared winemaking uh, at a super premium level, I got asked to be winemaker for CC Yench Cellars um, for Chris Yench. And he had been someone who had grown grapes for at least a decade, selling to notable wineries um, all over the valley, Grey Monk and um, Mission Hill and stuff like that. So he had over 50 acres of beautiful grapes on the Naramata bench and then, or not Naramata bench, that's where I am now, <laughs> Golden Mile bench. <laughs> So confusing. No problem. Uh, on the gold <laughs> mile bench. And he just got fed up with the whole grower winery kind of combativeness. And he's just said, hell with everybody. I'm going to start my own winery. Um, and so when I came on board, the original plan was to make one batch of red blend. And I started looking at his amazing vineyards and tasting what we could do with these grapes. And we started pulling off small lots and I convinced him to let me diversify the portfolio. And we had some amazing award-winning Syrahs, um, Malbecs and Cabernet Sauvignons and Cabernet Francs that won double golds and stuff all over the Pacific Northwest. And so really special fruit to work with. And I'm really lucky I had so much freedom to to just experiment and experience and uh left the wine industry for a couple of years to have some children <laughs> which you can hear in the background <laughs> yes <laughs> And then in 2018, um, Dwight Sick, who has, is a longtime friend of my husband, he approached me and asked if I wanted to start um, working a little bit, uh, mostly so he could take his vacation to Thailand. So I was kind of the seller babysitter uh, for him for a little bit and then started working um, on and off part-time and full-time and helped out with Harvest. 
2020 was an, another year off thanks to good old COVID. So I stayed home with the kids and the whole homeschooling thing. And then back this past summer, full time for the harvest. And as of January 1st, I'm the official winemaker for Moraine. Very excited to hear yeah. about how the transition, because of course you didn't start all the, you know, the ferments and, you know, where the wine's at. So this will be a, mm -hmm. a wonderful discussion because mm -hmm. I'm sure it happens and, and just how you manage that will be great. Yep. Yeah, definitely. All right. So Miss Cassandra, do we have a slide share? We do. All right, so ladies and gents, I prepared something for us to follow along so that maybe we can be carried away to the Okanagan if we're sitting oh, yeah. in dreary in dreary grayness. <laughs> uh, um, maybe we could start at slide number three there, Cassandra. Oh, we have the wrong presentation. Uh, Beautiful. We do? Yeah, we do. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem at all. Let me remedy that. Not a problem. I've stopped the screen share, correct? Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. So we've been we've been having uh we've been having a discussion. Uh Pinot Gris, was that always in the lineup? Mm -hmm. It's funny because I think for me, Riesling and Pinot Noir always carried my mind around Moraine. Uh yeah. Yeah, those are sort of the ones that we we say and Toshi probably agrees like those are we say what is Moraine known for like our two minute elevator pitch we're no known for our Rieslings and our Pinot Noirs. Um, we have have our own fruit so we have that like long term supply chain for it and it's something that has been being made ever since the beginning by. Okay. by yep. Yeah. Uh, so if we were tasting this six pack of wines that you've curated I would actually probably start with the Riesling uh, 2020 because it's probably the most austere and dry of of the wines in this in this flight um, 2020 I would say is a bit of a cooler vintage uh, so lots more minerality coming through on those wines a little more restrained a little more elegant whereas 2021 with that heat wave that we all remember uh, yeah. we have some really luscious, voluptuous wines, um, just because like, I don't pick based on chemistry, I pick based on flavors. Okay. So if the flavors aren't developed until the grapes are 22 bricks, then I'm picking them at 22 bricks and I have to deal with managing those alcohols in the cellar. And so what that means is we have a Pinot Gris and actually many of our whites that we bottled in January um, that feel very rich and have some residual right. sugar because we don't want to let them ferment to dryness and get like a 14% Gewurztraminer because nobody right. wants to drink that. So, yeah. so you have that, those amazing flavors, but you do have some of that lushness from the residual sugar and the sugars aren't crazy high either. It's just the overall uh, richness and ripeness of the vintage is really noticeable. So I think we're only tasting the 2021 um, Pinot Gris. So that's the one Nice. That we, we, I'll look forward to that a little later. Um, <laughs> yes, you will. Apologies. I think we're on the right screen here. Sorry about All that. Right. But All right. We are. So um, thank you, Cassandra. That's, that's really yeah. great. So uh, please, uh, let's let's have a quick intro to Moraine Winery, where it is, the mm -hmm. vineyards, viticulture. We'll talk a little bit. We can tell we love, you know, everything about winemaking. It's already coming through. So uh, yeah. we're keen to get to that part. Yeah. Absolutely. So here is our beautiful new winery building. Um, previously, all the wine was made in a little Quonset hut, which is still out back. It's where we, we store our equipment. Um, and so I think it was, yeah, 2019, we started making wine in this nice new facility. So um, whenever you come out to visit us, you'll be able to see it. Um, we are on the Naramata bench about halfway down. If you're familiar where bench 1775 winery is, we're just north of them. Um, we are facing to the west. So we get beautiful sunsets from our gorgeous patio off of our glass fronted wine shop. So it's really spectacular views and a beautiful setting. And I think our wine shop, um, staff have the most beautiful office in the world <laughs> with the with those views so um so that's where we're located 
and then next we, slide there yeah yeah there you go so if you were to just walk out of that building off to the side you'd be standing in our estate vineyard and this one is named anastasia so oleg the owner um he's named all of our own estate vineyards after his two daughters and then the most recent vineyard is named lily for his first granddaughter so this one is the anastasia vineyard named after his oldest daughter and here you can just see it's sloping down towards the lake facing that beautiful, there's the sun setting in the west. So it really tells everything that's special about Naramata. You know, we have a nice slope, we've got good air drainage. Like I've been just blown away how little frost damage I've seen so far in our vineyard, considering the minus 20 temperatures we had this year. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a testament to the air drainage and the air movement on our site um, and the lake effect. So even in the dead of winter, like that huge body of water acts as a heat sink. So it may seem like insignificant one degree or two degrees like being radiated back to us from the lake but in those killer temperatures it is literally it can make all the difference in the world between total fine death and and right fine vitality so um and then we get those nice long evenings of the setting sun just ripening our grapes um and, and so it's a really special site and here you can see an overview so where the road is running at the top there that's Naramata road and then the vineyard is sloping down on its way towards the lake and this picture must have been from 2018 or previous because you can see the two little white kind of domed Quonset buildings that's where all the winemaking used to happen and then there was a house where the owner lived and then there's a little place that used to be the wine shop um <laughs> so yeah so you can see um, and some improvements <laughs> some improvements yes yes so and here we can see now we're still in the same vineyard this is still Anastasia and if I had to guess I would say these guys are in our Merlot or our Malbec and so we've got Zinon on the left and Benigno on the right and these are two of our longtime um, temporary foreign workers they come up from Mexico they've been coming for the last four or five years so great um, just so happy to work and you can see here they're harvesting and so everything everything Moraine does is hand harvested they're harvesting them into those little blue bins and then as we're dumping the blue bins into the bigger bin it's a further opportunity to sort as we're dumping it in um, and and really we're sorting into those blue bins and leaving anything we don't like on the ground um, because that's that's the beauty of having your own estate you can be well, as fun as you want and you can really hover over the vines and pick every little leaf and really just like make the yield exactly what you want it and cluster thin to your heart's content so uh that's that's why estate labeled wines are usually more costly because of the lower yields and the higher labor involved but also the quality is is generally um superior so here we have a view of our cellar this would be peak harvest time you see all these blue fermenters they hold about a ton and a half of grapes and so we do have our large volume red which is called cliffhanger red and that one is fermented in large stainless tanks but everything else Syrah, Malbec, Cab Franc, uh, our port they're all fermented in these blue bins and this is only about a third of the blue bins that we have and so there you can just barely make out the stainless steel handle of the punch down tool in the bottom left corner there. So somebody <laughs> a few times a day, depending on the stage of fermentation that the wine is at, we go and we actually press down the tops of all those skins that you can see floating in the bins, push them down to the bottom, release that carbon dioxide that's building up in each of those fermenters, push those skins back down to extract more color and flavor. Um, if you were looking at the bins of Syrah right now, you would also see some cheeky little clusters of Viognier peeking out of there too because that one gets co-fermented with with some Viognier from our vineyard um, so the boards are there so you can scamper across the boards and balance and do your punch downs uh, and just keep walking and moving the boards and punching down so yeah, you were you were a gymnast in a previous life perhaps or <laughs> <laughs> not me <laughs> some balance being there yeah yeah, yeah. It is. 
some balance beam. Uh, yeah. So we also noticed there were some barrels in that room. Yes, yes, you can see some barrels off to the side there. So they, those may very well be full of uh, some barrel fermenting Chardonnay or Viognier perhaps, uh, which is why they're in there. So if they do kind of burp over, then they're in the cellar where we can hose them off easily. Um, right now, Maureen is exclusively French oak. And generally with our wines, we're going for about a about a 30% new oak kind of influence. So we're cycling the barrels out. And once they get totally neutral, we sort of cull some out and sell them off. Um, yeah, we're using a variety of coopers. Like we really like to use coopers that are sort of a Burgundian style because again, Moraine is known for Pinot Noir. So we are using predominantly Burgundian style barrels. So a little bit fatter barrel, um, but we do for our Cabernet Franc and a lot of our Merlot use some Bordeaux barrels, um, the longer skinnier barrels. And uh, so everything is fermented for the reds. Everything's fermented just about to dryness. And then it goes into barrel and ages for varying lengths of time, depending on which wine it is and how much oak it can kind of support like Malbec and Pinot Noir, not as much as say the Cabernets and the Merlot. Right. Uh, yeah. One of the things I, do appreciate about moraine is the delicate touch and the balance uh, that oak uh, is presenting in each mm -hmm. of the styles that it's involved in mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it, that is a, a heavy hand but here i find it mostly a very well balanced uh, hand so yeah mm -hmm. thank you for saying that and, and that's by intention because um while i used to work predominantly in oliver you know, you can make bigger wines that can support a smokier, bolder expression of oak, but you can't do that in, in Naramata or farther north because the fruit is just more delicate and light. Yeah. So you have to just enhance it and create complexity. Uh, trying to create a California cab in Naramata is really, you're wasting your <laughs> time and your money <laughs> and your reputation. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll yeah. just taste like a smokehouse and that'll yeah. be that, no exactly. fruit. Yeah, all right, lovely. So yes, Pinot Gris 2021. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a luscious, ripe vintage. This Pinot Gris comes 100% from that Anastasia vineyard we were looking at. Uh, we do buy some Pinot Gris from Okanagan Falls, but that makes its way into our cliffhanger white blend, kind of our, our aromatic Alsatian white blend. So this is 100% Naramata bench, estate fruit. So this really gives you an expression of what our what our terroir, what our specific vineyard tastes like. It, there is that underlying spine of minerality in there and really nice, still loads of fresh acidity despite being such a hot year and a ripe vintage, um, but just very generous um, in the, on the nose, loads of orchard fruit and on the palate, there's just lots of succulents with this okay. wine, really good. Do you have a favorite pairing? I mean, I'm curious. I, I threw in mine, but I'm always curious what, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my maker might say. Yeah, I like this wine a lot with sushi and also with like um, salads that I have put fruit in, you know, like you put grilled peaches in something and some prosciutto. Uh, it's really nice with like charcuterie and cheeses and things like that. It makes a nice. great aperitif, uh, really a really friendly wine, whether with or without food. Uh, it'd be nice with a risotto or something as well you know, with some mm. scallops. Mm. Mm. I like richness and, and freshness mm -hmm. and yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's great. So only 232 cases. So I think that's kind of interesting to note because the case sizes and case lots from each of these styles varied, which mm -hmm. maybe you'll uh, address at some point too. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's, again, the last couple of years, the yields have really been down. There was some killing temperatures in 2019. Vineyards are just recovering from that and then we had some heat which yeah. yeah makes them riper but also it desiccates the fruit and um yeah so yields have been down case productions have been down the quality is awesome but right yeah how did you uh, how did you time the harvest uh for 2021 like you know that heat dome came in and it was just like wow um 
you know? Yeah. There was another a year like where I was just like, ah, oh, can we catch a break? You know, like rain at the wrong time, cold at the wrong time. And then just like fires and heat, like fires and floods and hail and brimstone. It was just like, uh, like yeah, I'm surprised I have any hair left in my head this from like, <laughs> um but it was it it actually was good like and it was just a matter of really tasting the fruit like constantly and like waiting for those flavors and then as soon as the flavors were ready pick 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 and and was it earlier than normal uh you know or or like suddenly it's like you have two days and we got to get it off in two days or how does <laughs> how does that go like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it was one of those ones where things were delayed and then they caught up and then they were speeding ahead but then they kind of slowed down again which was which was great because then we just kind of got to have everything kind of come into balance a little bit more in terms of like acid levels and sugar levels and things like that um so it was maybe just it, it was earlier than previous years mm -hmm. but it was kind of like in line with the average I would mm -hmm. say it seemed early because the other ones had been late. So this one seemed more like, huh, this is normal. Weird. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just a sidebar, I visited Alsace in November of 2019. Oh. Uh, oh. And uh, when I was there, uh, went to a beautiful place called, you know, there's it's beautiful. But uh, mm -hmm. the conversations were uh, 30 years later, we are harvesting a month earlier. Oh my gosh. The climate yeah. change has really affected them. And what they're seeing mm. is the alcohol levels in their wines. They just aren't managing like, you know, 50, 14 mm. and a half, 15% mm. for white wine. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's coming in our direction, but I would say I didn't see that here. So, um, yeah. And, and they have such a history of winemaking. Like they have a better, a better like slope to really see, like if it's a blip or like a long time trend, right. but I mean, fires are going to be the way going forward, whether it, we did not experience any ill effects for ourselves in Naramata, but I know further South people did. And it's just, it's going to be a game of Russian roulette every year. Like who's going to get the bullet this year with the smoke, you know, and it might be Washington state or California. And I sort of see us all as one, one kind of, yeah. Yeah. brother sisterhood region you know because we are sort of all sharing the same air and water <laughs> from our you know like our water <laughs> flows to yeah. Washington it's not just like well there it goes the flood it's out of our hair now no it's like plaguing just across the border like our our peers and our colleagues um over there so I do view it as sort of like our mini or macro region right do you think uh, do you think uh uh it's going to be, we'll be oaking wines, or do you think we'll be treating smoke taint, or do you think that that's going to be an issue? Um, I mean, it's maybe we'll talk about it that at the end, because sure. I want everyone yeah. to enjoy the story about the wines, mm -hmm. but maybe yes, I'll yeah. that. And, but it is a very, a very uh, like hot topic, and it's a huge topic every wine making mm -hmm. seminar I've been on. So, yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So here we are with Riesling Reserve 2020, mm -hmm. and I do love Riesling, and you do mm -hmm. have a few kinds in the tasting room when I was there. I think <laughs> I tried three different styles and had them all lined up, and what a great, mm -hmm. what a great experience that is. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants to do that, go to Moraine. <laughs> do, do, and um, perhaps Jerry can even confirm this. I think we're going to be offering like a, a specific Riesling tasting with four different Rieslings this year, because as a, a staff group, we tried... A, a vertical of our Rieslings going back to 2016 ish. Um, and they're so different. And it's really a tale yeah, of vintage was... winemaking, like from searingly austere to very sweet. So, um, really interesting to hear the story behind each of those and just to show people like the many personalities of Riesling. It's not just sweet totally totally brandy wine and so it's it can be really interesting and uh, i think the big takeaway for most of us was the how rieslings really get more interesting with age yes they do they get way more complex and a lot of people really appreciated uh the older ones versus the young fruity and friendly ones that's been my experience. And I think there's not a lot of us that hang on to our BC Riesling. It's like people no. shopping, it's inexpensive, like so silly Riesling, 20 bucks on the shelf. This vintage, yeah. everybody's buying it and drinking. It's like, no, 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 wait, wait, mm -hmm. just give it like, give it 10 mm -hmm. years. <laughs> yep. 
Yep, totally, totally. So they, they, we're, we are going to start holding back a portion of our production every year, like as a library selection, so that we can have these really fun, educational, interesting, inspiring Riesling tastings with, with more than just our, our own staff. Cool. Jerry, did you want to, did you want to say a few words? No, I was just com confirming once Amber allows me to start pouring the 2021, then we'll absolutely be doing the vertical Riesling because yeah. the complexity of the flavors and mm -hmm. you know, just in uh, the season and the heat as Amber was talking about, it's amazing the flavor profiles that come through. Right. Well, you just keep us posted when that's going to happen because I think there'll be a few hey. people heading your way. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we can get that, on, that onto the, the social media so we can tell yeah. people. I know there are Riesling people out there. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> David's smiling like me. <laughs> um, so this reserve Riesling, um, this was a blend of our Anastasia vineyard again, and then two doors down towards the south, we lease a vineyard called Red Rose. And so a portion of this is, is blended. So it's Anastasia and Red Rose blended together. And the Red Rose tends to be riper. So I imagine it was uh, a, a matter of finding that balance between uh, bright, racy acidity and uh, ripeness. Sometimes they are just austere. Sometimes they are. And yeah. Sometimes you feel like your teeth are going <laughs> to. Yeah. 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 A Riesling tasting can be dangerous for your, <laughs> your palate. Yeah. Uh, lots of cheese. There's lots of cheese to protect your teeth through that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, clone 49, and uh, forgive me, I don't know, is this a Mosul clone or an Alz Alsace clone? Mosul, yep. Okay. Which is, if anyone is interested. 232 yes. cases. This is the magic mm -hmm. number again. Yes. And, uh, what are your that favorite? My fault, Barb. Barb, I had skipped the slide, so it was 454 for Pinot. Oh. Pinot. I moved to the next slide. Sorry about that. So that's where I'm that. just spreading bad information. All right. It's fake <laughs> know, news, people. It's, it's all my fault. Please blame me. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> I was going to say that's the same number. What happened? Yeah, what a weird, random, precise number. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yes. So, favorite pairings with this? Mm, um, yeah, something really rich. Maybe a quiche would be my my choice. Um, like a or, or a tart flambe if you're lucky enough to know how to make that or get your hands on some. So, anything like eggy. Um, salty meat. You know, like all your sort of like what you'd think of as like. German derived foods, you know, like salty sausages and rich potato and cream and egg dishes. Um, it'd be a great brunch wine, you know, with, you know, a nice cheese souffle would be just spectacular spot on pairing with this. Um, a selection of nice cheeses as well with some nice fruit would be, would be a nice casual way of enjoying it too. Yeah. Very Sounds good. delicious. Yeah, yeah like I fondue idea. Yet? <laughs> the fondue. I, I'm gonna go oh, with fondue. fondue. Yes. Good yes. one, Barb. Thank you. Yeah, fondue, Thank you very much. Raclette. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That'd be very delicious. So I'm just gonna for the Vancouver folks, there's a little uh, deli called the Black Forest Deli over in Park Royal. And I went over for our international Riesling Day and I bought a uh, frozen uh Spätzle and I bought European wieners and I boiled up some potatoes. And then I made uh, fried onions, put the spätzle in, put in potatoes, put cheese on top. <laughs> it's like everybody's dream when you sip Riesling, something like oh. decadent like that. Yes, totally. That sounds, wow, good for you. <laughs> yes, so Park Royal. I wish I lived closer. <laughs> uh, I'm coming up to the Okanagan. I'll bring you some frozen packs. Nice. Anyway, yes. All right, so now we're on to what I have in my glass here, which yeah. is really just, the nose is just so pretty, honestly. I love it. Mm. Yeah, and you can really get that stoniness, the wet stones and that minerality. And like you said, very delicate hand with the oak, um, not trying to bend, you know, bend it to your will with oak. It's uh, got, it's, 
good cedar, like spice, um, a nice earthiness to it. I just love that there's some fruit, you know, there's mm -hmm. just some fruit at the, and it's yep. sweet. It's sweet, you know, red, mm -hmm. like maybe cherry and strawberry. It's just that beautiful kind of fruit that like makes me go, oh, hello, yep. you know? Yes. Yeah, it is definitely the, the bright, juicy red fruit. We are reserved Pinot Noir 2020 is also worth the taste because it is deep, dark, mysterious, black mm. fruit, blue fruit. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's really special, really special as well. This one is a little more um, friendly, accessible kind of Pinot Noir, but still pretty classic BC Pinot Noir, if you ask me. Um, uh, yeah. How much time in oak? Uh, this about 10 months. Okay. So once it's done, fermentation spends about 10 months in. And in, only 30% of the, of the juice? Or the, the Pinot Noir probably gets a little bit more of a new oak, maybe about 40%. Um, we really do treat it nicely with some uh, beyond barrels predominantly from a variety of forests in France. So a mixture of super tight grain oak and medium tight grain oak. Um, and uh, and quite a few cases made because it is one of the more popular styles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And where are the vineyards for the Pinot Noir? Are they Anastasia too? So no Pinot Noir is at Anastasia, but where Oleg's home is, where the owner's home is, he has the Sophia Vineyard named after his youngest daughter. And that's where the Pinot Noir grows is down there. So still on the Naramata bench. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, this one is 100% Naramata bench. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's special. It's very special. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, and it's really nice when we can do those single vineyard wines so we can really taste the vineyard, which mm -hmm. sounds weird to some people, mm -hmm. but I really... <laughs> Not if you're crazy for wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there was a, a wine that um, Maureen made that went into some sausages at Home on the Range Organics. Oh. Were you around at that point? Okay. I don't know about that. Okay. No, that, that's very look, interesting. Look that up. I, it, it may have been something like a Merlot, but I, I recall them being just fantastic. So hmm. interesting. I know we did uh, send some of our uh, pressed grape skins to Wine Crush Market, mm -hmm. and then they make various things with uh, winery kind of uh, byproducts, but I don't know. Yeah, I know they make salt and ketchup and different sort of things with, with the pumice and skins. All right. Well, All right, we'll move on, shall we? Definitely. This is so interesting. Yes. So go ahead and tell us because it's juicy and surprising yes. and, it and is. next and next month is Malbec month so or oh. April 17th is International Malbec Day so this okay. could be a good candidate for that mm -hmm. yes yeah, so we're looking at a nice very purple very purple wine Malbec usually is very purple um when we make rosé from Malbec we have to be careful because it gives a lot of color very quickly um so this is 100% Anastasia Vineyard um, people are always intrigued by it because it's Naramata Bench, it's Malbec, it's single vineyard. Um, and it's the one probably along with the Cab Franc that makes me kind of go ah, the most, like, is it going to make it to the finish line? You know? Um, oh, you mean in the fermentation? No, in the vineyard. <laughs> oh, in the vineyard. Oh, because of like safe in the vineyard no problem like okay yeah. but it's one of those ones where it's really like tiptoeing along the border of being hardy mm -hmm. you know so um you really want to avoid those vegetal qualities and if you've ever seen a merlot or a malbec cluster it's like the size of a baby it's humongous so you <laughs> we're, we're just like making all these passes through the malbec just slashing parts of the clusters off and like just horrifying amounts of fruit get left on the on the vineyard floor because we just want to make sure we're not getting those green flavors like you have the main cluster and then they each have like two clusters coming off the side so we're chopping them off making sure we're getting the leaf pulling done getting that exposure just trying to destroy those green bell pepper green bean flavors um you know i 
I've had well, some. That, that was my surprise here that yeah. you've just told us your secret too, because yeah. I was like, how are they doing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's marvelous like, to the owners. Please look away. We're thinning them all back today. Just don't look, don't look. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and that's all you can do like when you're growing on the on the edge of viticulture you know you have to be just heartless harsh harsh um, yeah hard. yeah you got to pull those leaves drop oh. those clusters um but then you get something that's really interesting and really nuanced and has freshness you know and not big sweet jammy boozy like I like those too, but like these make you keep coming back for more because they're so yeah. nuanced and, and delicate. Yeah. Yeah. 10% mm. Merlot comes from the same uh, vineyard, Anastasia. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 14% alcohol. So we don't have too much alcohol. I thought it was mm -hmm. interesting uh, that coffee note kind of it, mm -hmm. it comes up, it comes up, which I think is a classic marker for Malbec mm -hmm. in any tasting. Mm -hmm. um, and I love it with like grill, like in mm -hmm. Argentina, it's with grilled yep. meat. Like that's just what you do. So juicy. 100%. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Like a, like smokies or even more upscale grilled sausages, yes. some grilled peppers, um, grilled potatoes. Um, yeah. Batatas fritas from Spain, fried grilled potatoes. Um, yeah, I can't go wrong. And if, and if people have game meats around, I'm not lucky enough to have an ac access to good quality venison or anything like that. But if someone were to have nice game meat around, this would be lovely with it. Mm. Duck would mm. be good with this too, because of that berry note, the acidity. The acidity is so good on these. Mm. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is like, uh, that's, and you know, uh, it's interesting. So mm, just a sidebar that, you know, I have friends, like when they taste wine, like my mother, she'll be like, oh, that's sharp, which is what yeah. people refer to when they're tasting mm -hmm. too much acidity. And I said, just mm -hmm. wait, you know, once you yeah. taste the meat. Yeah, yeah. Your whole glass will change for you in on your palate. And she, you know, so I just think this is a lovely wine to demonstrate that with, because it's mm -hmm. such a perfect pairing too. Yeah. Amber, we do have a question for you from Sid yes. here. Um, he'd like us, to, he'd like you uh, or us, but um, I'm, I think you're better uh, uh, to answer this question than I, um, to expand on the pros and cons of using some of the riper stems in the fermentation of the Pinot. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and usually we do include, if the stems are ripe, uh, to include a little bit of the stems into the ferment. Um, like you hear more and more these days, people are like manically sorting out every little bit of stem, AKA Jack, AKA Rakus out of their Pinot Noir ferments because you can get that green bean flavor. So we would actually take the stems and put them in our mouth and chew them. Let those enzymes in your mouth kind of go to work and see like what the enzymes in your mouth are gonna do. How's that gonna translate into the finished wine? So they do have tannins in them. Um, and so it helps to really fix the color into the wine and it can help to just give you a bit more of like a framework in the wine. Um, like I like a sweet, rich, jammy wine as much as the next person, but it gives you just like a bit more of a grip, like in a wine, it gives it just more layers. It's not just like, Ooh, yum, yum. You know, it, it makes it more cerebral. Like you're thinking about, you're taking another sip. Like, what am I getting here? Like, um, you know, it just frames it a little bit more. Um, mm. and it can enhance some of those flavors of, it can sometimes bring some of those flavors of like, uh, cedar or black tea. Um, and, and the tannins from the stems can help with things, like I said, color fixation, which in Pinot Noir, it's very, it loses its color very readily. Like it has a very unstable pigment in Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And so that can fix the help to fix the color at a very er, early stage. And by fix, I mean like bind it, not like fix did, it. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, not help, doctor, like, but to yeah, yeah. To solidify color mm -hmm. at, a, at an early stage. Um, and it can just sort of help to fill some holes maybe in the palate if you have just like a disjointedness between fruit and tannin and oak, like it can kind of sort of bridge the gap between some of those 
um, components. And if you get that like donut kind of quality in some wines where you're like, oh, it's like coating almost all in my mouth, but the center palate is like not there, like a donut. It can kind of bridge that gap and give it a more holistic uh, sensation in your mouth. <laughs> Cool. Thank you, Amber. Would you would you would you say, Amber, then you're uh destemming, you're not destemming? You know? We are we are destemming, right. but if the stems are good, we may choose to let some clusters just we okay. may even just like by hand throw, throw a certain percentage of clusters in after we're destemming. Mm -hmm. But you know, it has to be absolutely flawless fruit and perfectly ripe, st ripe stems. Cause like a juicy green stem and the Malbec is notorious for having really thick succulent green stems. Like it just tastes like you're eating a green bean, you know, like, and nobody wants that. So they have to be lignified and dried and you have to taste them and you have to have really healthy, like free of botrytis, free of black mildew and things like that. So everything really has to be perfect in order to play with that. I also like that you're out there tasting stems and other parts of, oh you know, gosh, like yeah. making decisions. It's like, it's not one thing. It's not one dimensional. No, it's not. It's the, even mm -hmm. just like the tasting of a grape. You t I, I squeeze the grape into my hand. I taste the pulp, spit out the pulp, crunch the seeds with my teeth, spit out the seeds. Then I put the skin back in my mouth and then I'm chewing that up. So it's all those different components, like to see their ripeness and to see how you're feeling about the overall picture and really letting the enzymes in your saliva go to work on that interesting. too. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So interesting. I love it. Well, thanks for sharing that because then <laughs> we'll know what you're doing out there when we see you just why standing my, there. <laughs> why my teeth look so awful for four months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's just red wine stains. I have a gray <laughs> smile at times. It's like, oh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting. So Cab Franc, 300 and, oh, yeah. Malbec. How many cases of Malbec do we oh. have? Yeah. Toshi, I think, said we have 100 left until the end of like till the next vintage. So this is going to be a sellout. Yeah. Yep. So it's cool. Yeah. And again, we don't have supply outside of our own vineyard. So it's a very delimited amount of fruit we have for this. So when it's gone, it's gone. Right. Um, not much Malbec being grown in our neck of the woods. That's more something that people down south might might play with. Yeah. When I worked at BC Yench, we did have a really great Malbec. Um, but yeah, it's still a bit unusual even down there. Yeah, very few producers of Malbec for sure in the Okanagan mm -hmm. overall. Okay. All right, so Cab Franc. Cab Franc, sorry. I, I love thinking. Cab Franc. BC Cab Franc. <clears throat> Who loves Cab Franc? Put up your hands. Oh, I do, I do, I yeah. do. <laughs> I think Cab Franc. Um, could become the signature red for the Okanagan. That's my own personal opinion. Uh, just because I think in a in a ripe year it can really be quite stunning, and it has a little it has a little more personality than say Merlot. Um, I don't think anyone really wants their region to be known for Merlot. <laughs> Sorry, Pomerol. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just I feel like it really. I mean, and especially with global warming, you know, as we get more and more ripe years. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think Cap Franc could really. I, I agree, David. Syrah is yeah is amazing too. <laughs> yes, that's true. It's true. Well, uh, Syrah of it of it many is kind of the same as Cap Franc. The Syrah of many characters too. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but yes we'll be fighting that one out i i'm afraid mm -hmm. i just don't want to be another australia you know or or be kind of shadow in the shadow of something like oh people just assume that it's going to be this one mm -hmm. style when really mm -hmm. it's so diverse like good heavens mm -hmm. we're so yeah. lucky but it's also yeah. so hard to market amber this this the um cap franc like the, the Syrah has a, a difficult time in the Okanagan and uh, often dies off. So mm -hmm. that frog doesn't go through the same thing as far as I know, or am I incorrect there? Yeah, so I think, um, Cassandra, there is a, a virus that seems to really affect Syrah specifically. Um, and it's a real, it's still baffling even like the best scientists that we have at like the research center and things like that. Um, and so that is, a very it's weird yeah you'll just have a super healthy beautiful vine just drop dead halfway through the season with in the middle of a block of vines that look 
perfectly flawless. This one just like <sighs> dies. It's, it's really weird. But Kev Franck, from in my experience, seems to be one of the hardier varieties, like hardy to cold. Um, it's got a thick skin, so it doesn't get plagued too much by uh, powdery mildew and botrytis the way other red varietals do. It's it's a pretty tough little varietal, in my opinion. Like um, I'm always I always kind of give it a little pat on the leaf when I when I walk <laughs> by it because it's you know as long as it ripens, it's it's a good little soldier out there in the vineyard. <laughs> mm -hmm. The third fiddle is number one in BC, right? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, let's see, 340 cases. Does everybody know, you know, the sort of the touchstone in France for Cabernet Franc, at least besides Bordeaux? That would be my question. If anybody does, just put the answer in the chat. Hey, it's Chinon. <laughs> and uh, Chinon ever and wins. <laughs> Uh, lucky enough to have been to Chinon and tasted Cab Franc there. Um, I think ours is better. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you say that. Uh, Bernard Beaudry uh, is kind of a producer that I like. And I recently did a Cab Franc tasting and it was like, it's a little closer to the way our style is because there's some very soft ones out there that I was kind of like, mm, you know, uh, from... I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. Domaine de Palouse, very lovely, older vintage, mm -hmm. soft. And I was like, I want a little bit more. And and also Brett, we don't do, we don't have a lot of Brett in our wine, do we? Do you think that's a character of the winery or the or the grape? Um yeah, um, for me, like Brett in French wines, it's kind of one of those like really good like marketing twists where it's like they had this thing that's like well, kind of a flaw, but like they've spun it to like be kind of a good thing, you know, um, you know, kind of like Beaujolais Nouveau or <laughs> right things like that, you know, where you take a wine where it's kind of like, whoa, and then you spin it in this really great way. So um, maybe like a very, very indiscernible whiff of Brett kind of adds complexity, but I, I feel like there's other ways we can get complexity in our wines without mm -hmm. having that. That's my nightmare is having. Mm -hmm. so, I do yeah. have a, another good question here from Sid about um, seeing any leaf roll or red blotch in the vineyards are you are you experience anything anything like that and, and i don't know if it's something that just hasn't really hit naramata hard as a as a whole like um definitely when i was in the south there's more of that um so i don't know if it just hasn't made its way to us if we don't have a particular like say insect vector spreading it the way it does in other regions um i don't know if it's gonna come to us so you know fingers crossed like we in our own estate vineyards it's been pretty good um but certainly yeah colleagues and friends have got lots of that going on seems to different varietals, different regions uh, suffer a little bit more. Mm. Um, we suffer more from rodents eating the roots of our gamay. That seems to be the big one for us is like our poor gamay, like <laughs> it's just, we want to produce more and more rosé and we'd like to make a red gamay, but for whatever reason, the underground rodents just like live under our gamay and eat its roots and <laughs> kill it so everyone's got their own little kind of problems um but yeah Sid uh not so much leaf roll and red blotch for us um cold rodents uh leaf hoppers last year were brutal it was a very dry year so leaf hoppers are related to grasshoppers and grasshoppers were just like devastating like all the grain crops and wheat crops and stuff like that and the grasshoppers really our leaf hoppers were really terrible last year in vineyards so that was a bad one for a lot of people so the leaf hoppers destroy the canopy is that the issue yeah yeah and it just looks like the leaves go totally like bronzed and brown they just like um like they're not like a they don't puncture and suck they like chafe the leaves okay. with their sharp mouths um and and destroy them that way so you just like especially when i was driving 
uh, through Okanagan Falls. I was just like, holy crap, like everything was brown. And it's not because it was so hot and dry. It's because of the leaf hoppers. They were just interesting. Out. Yeah, last year. I've moved us forward to the Meritage. I okay. hope that's okay. Bar? Sure. Oh, yes. Cab Franc. What would we eat with Cab Franc? Everything, yeah. anything. That's the one like um, my husband likes with steak um good with like yeah rich meats because it's got like a bit of rusticness to it um yeah it's it's with your or braised meats like a, a pot roast um uh, braised short ribs if you can afford those <laughs> used to be a cheap off-cut meat yeah. now it's as expensive as filet <laughs> god <laughs> i'll take the filet Thanks. yes absolutely <laughs> i'm paying for bones anymore um but yeah like with something nice and rich and braised would be gorgeous or uh like we make wood-fired pizza here at home it'd be so lovely if you don't eat meat with mushroom dishes like a mushroom pizza with some gooey fontina cheese would be really good and lots of time <laughs> with some fresh thyme sprinkled on it I hope someone's cooking at your place. <laughs> Chicken fingers and fries. <laughs> it gets better. It gets better. Yes, so yes. here we are with a vintage uh, 2019. So I guess we should probably just talk a little bit about the vintage. Uh, this blend stays relatively consistent, does it? does yep um merlot and cab franc and uh i think from time to time includes some malbec um and the malbec just kind of brings that freshness and that lightness to it because this does barrel age for the longest probably of any of our wines so this one is sort of in the 18 to 24 months aging kind of program and that's just to really try and soften out that cab franc a little bit more um so these would be barrel selections. So when we go to make all the rest of our wines, we're sort of tasting every single barrel, selecting out the ones that we know can age really beautifully. And then we hang on to those ones. So um, right now I'm tasting like the 2020s in barrel, deciding which ones are gonna stay for sure as part of our Meritage program. And then that I'll start racking that probably in May and start getting that ready to bottle later in the summer. Um, so, so the 2020s are still in barrel right now. And so this, yeah, it's got that sweet black cherry note from the ripe Merlot. The Merlot comes from our lease property down the road called Red Rose. It tends to be our richest, ripest Merlot. And then the Cabernet Franc would come from our Anastasia vineyard. And I think in some years we've, we've brought in, yeah, so this is Red Rose and Anastasia. Yeah, so the Cabernet Franc is 36% on this. The Merlot is 62 and then the Malbec is 6%. So the Malbec brings like that nice freshness to the barrel aged wines. And then the other ones, of course, the Merlot brings the ripeness, the alcohol, the, the softness, and then the Cab Franc brings that framework, that structure, um, that kind of masculinity to the blend. David is wondering uh, if you keep all the barrels separate to the very end, or if there's a process of kind of interblending as you go, or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, because I've been actually sort of, as I've been tasting the barrels, kind of pondering that like do I give them a blend and then put them back into barrel as a whole but maybe it's just like my own kind of like control freak nature like I want to just leave everything separate and kind of like see what each one can do especially since I'm still getting to know like what each vineyard does and what each cooperage does because I'm working with some cooperages I haven't worked with before I just want to really I'm, everything's still on trial you know like I really want to see how does Red Rose Merlot specifically do in a one-year-old boots barrel? So I want everything to still kind of stay separate so I can really just see like, is it better to stay in a neutral barrel or should it have gone into more new oak? You know, would the yeah. Cab Franc have been better if it was all brand new oak and maybe all the Merlot was in a one-year-old barrel or half one-year-old, half neutral. So I'm still kind of like, everything's still kind of on trial where I want to see what each component does best in what, in what situation. So 
yes, David, everything is going to be kept separate probably right until I know what the final blend is. And I have taken little proportion proportions from each barrel and made some little blends in the, in the lab, you know, proportionate blends just to see like, Oh, maybe I want to, maybe I want to bring in a barrel of something that's from the 2021 vintage and kind of just swap it in, you know, uh, to bring a little bit of that crazy ripe vintage that we had. Maybe I want to boost up the richness just a little bit by bringing in one barrel of, of current, um, latest vintage into that so yeah that's that is the blending art I think the meritage blend is like the highest sort of um level of blending that the winemaker does because it's also kind of like a big deal you know like you think of all the biggest notable wineries not just in the Okanagan but in the world you think of Bordeaux you know you think of those Napa reds you think of super Tuscan so um those are big boots to fill and so you really kind of as a winemaker feel that and you can't just oh well this is what we have we're just going to slap it all together because that's what we got like I think I think any winemaker uh worth worth their worth their uh, salt or whatever <laughs> you know worth their feel, grapes yeah worth <laughs> the grapes yeah would, would feel the same you know you, you want to live up to that expectation that a meritage red Bordeaux blend kind of carries. Yeah. It's a signature style, I think, for the mm -hmm. house. I also mm -hmm. think the price is, is low, but, uh, you mm -hmm. know, well done. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to yeah. say anything. I'm happy to tell everybody to at least buy a couple bottles because, you know, most yeah. of them are 50 bucks now. So that's yeah. also coming. That's ahead for all of us. So, yeah. It is. And just like I'm, I'm ordering my oak barrels now and it's between 40 to 90 euros up for eat per barrel from what it was last year. Yeah. Glass has doubled in price. Yeah. The, pa the paper, the labels get printed on has gone up in price. So it's just, everything has gone everything. up a lot. So, um, yeah, the wines will catch up as well. Well, that brings us, I think to the last slide, uh, just, uh, or not the last slide, second, last slide. You want to just take that one step for yes. So this is the offer. Yes. We have for six bottles and 12 bottles. So everything we've talked about today, these are available mm -hmm. and these are uh, continuing to be available until orderable until the 31st of March. So that is awesome. And the links are everywhere. They're on my website. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram, mm -hmm. on my link tree. But they're also, uh, I think, available on your website. So this is great. And then there's a couple more exciting features that I think I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do we make a reservation? We call, we go online or we show up. I think that's an awesome feature. And mm -hmm. also for anyone who wants to go and stay overnight, Oh my mm -hmm. goodness. It's oh my beautiful. Goodness. Yeah. yeah. So very tempting, uh, especially because I hope that sunshine is there when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, me too. I know that's a picture perfect day. I yeah. think that's real. <laughs> that is quite the view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that kind of brings us to the end, you know, of our presentation. If uh, there are any questions, uh, please, uh, you can unmute, uh, you can ask, you can share your thoughts. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. Please, if you have to go, I totally understand. I, I know we have some, some running over an hour, but um, yeah, anyway, uh, thank you everyone. And I, I just want to say thank you, Amber. A big round of My applause. Pleasure. That just, was great. Uh, thank really you. Really great presentation. And uh, all the reasons that uh, I appreciate Maureen, uh, you know, you really <laughs> articulated today. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Very proud. Yeah. And uh, you a recent award. Do you, do you want to talk about that? The Pinot Noir All World or whatever. It was a big championship just announced and you came in second or third or oh. first or I don't know. Wonderful. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'll give you an award. <laughs> okay, maybe, so maybe Toshi, Toshi might know more about that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's do one final picture. If you want to just take your wine bottle that you uh, had with you oh, yeah. today, if you had one and hold it in the screen. And I'm just going to do a quick shot. And these pictures I'll share on social. And uh, I will do three. If you don't have a bottle, do a glass. <laughs> three, two, one, and three, two, one. Lovely. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank we've you. recorded the session. I'm going to turn the recording off.
I will share uh, the recording uh, through the uh, 